For our gospel this morning, we continue through uh, Mark. We're in chapter 10, looking at verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, for it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles... Those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of our Lord. How many of you have seen this meme or something similar to it? It says, are you easily discouraged? Here's a man who, and then it lists a whole bunch of bad things that happen, failing in business and defeating, being defeated in politics. And then it says, that man was Abraham Lincoln. Anybody seen this meme before? Very popular, goes around a lot. It details every one of Lincoln's many failures in life. Business, personal, political, even his mental health uh, is up there. Here's the rub, though. None of it is true. Or, at best, it's an exaggeration of a truth meant to amplify the magnitude of Lincoln's failures, but to a misleading degree. Take, for example, that first one, failed in business, 1831. That sounds pretty terrible, right? Except, according to the well-researched entry on Snopes.com, it is a misleading claim. Here's what actually happened. Lincoln left his father's home for good in 1831, and along with his cousin, John Hanks, took a flatboat full of provisions down the Mississippi River from Illinois to New Orleans on behalf of a a bustling but not too scrupulous uh, businessman named Denton Offit. Offit had planned to open a general store and he promised to make Lincoln its manager when Abraham returned from New Orleans. Lincoln operated the store as Offit's clerk and assistant for several months and by all accounts he did a fine job of it until Offit a poor businessman overextended himself financially and ran that business into the ground. Thus, by the spring of 1832, Lincoln had indeed lost his job, but not because he had failed in business. Lincoln failed in business to the degree that, uh, I don't know, a, a cashier at Sears failed in business when Sears filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy earlier this week. You could make the case that outgoing CEO Eddie Lampert failed in business, but the clerk, would you really make that claim? Nah. So it raises a question. Why does this meme circulate with such regularity? And by the way, I could go through and and nuance those other ones, but that's not worthy of our time right now. If people who, who share this and who even came up with it aren't trying to communicate fact, what lowercase t truth are they trying to communicate with this meme? 
I think the answer has a lot to do with our culture's motivational poster business focus. We are constantly seeking motivation to overcome the failures and challenges of life. We seek such motivation because we are told that we are to be ever striving for greatness. We are to be a high achieving people. As such, we're nearly addicted to, to rankings and standings and scores. Ask any parent of a grade schooler whose kids are going through a series of standardized tests. We're addicted to these sorts of rankings and systems. Of course, parents turn around and do it to the educational system once college comes up because who wants to send their kid to like a bottom 400 U.S. News and World Reports ranked university or college, right? I, I'm pretty sure we're one generation away from hearing parents say things like, well, you know, my child's a 1330, and I really think that a 1220 school should accept him. We're addicted to this ranking culture. As such, it really, uh, we, we should understand, we, and it shouldn't be much of a stretch for us to identify with James and John in our gospel reading this morning. Now, I think it's important to put their requests to Jesus in context. They, they ask to be number one and number two, CFO and COO to Jesus' CEO, right after a bunch of teachings and experiences that really should have had them thinking differently. In chapter 9, the entire group of 12 is debating who is going to be the greatest, and Jesus ended that debate by inviting a little child into his arms and saying, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one, uh, welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. If heard correctly, it is a lesson about embracing littleness, not greatness. Something very similar happens again in chapter 10. And then after this, Jesus has his encounter which, with the rich young ruler that we discussed last week, which reminds us that youth, wealth, and power are not benefits in the kingdom of God, except that we have the privilege of giving them away. Again, littleness is almost preferred. At the very least, we should understand after reading that story that the woman who gave her last two copper coins had an easier time divesting herself of all worldly wealth than that young man. Finally, right before our reading picks up, Jesus explains in rather graphic detail all that he has to suffer at the hands of both Jews and Gentiles alike as the Messiah. Greatness is hardly the key of the song that he is singing here. And thus it is now in this moment that the brothers Zebedee decide to reignite the debate from two chapters ago about greatness amongst the disciples. I mean, read the room, guys. So what are we to take away from our brother's foolhardy request? It's tempting to take their pendulum and swing it in the opposite extreme and say something like, let us not care about worldly power, acclaim, or wealth. Let us reject all these things as mere mirages. But that's, that's more Buddhist in thinking than Christian. It is then tempting to think that maybe the key lies in trying to find a moderation of the two extremes. This is the Goldilocks approach. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. We are to strive, but not too significantly. We are to have, but not too much. We are to climb, but not too high. But that's actually more Aristotelian in its thinking than Christian. No, as is so often the case, Jesus doesn't just point to a nuanced position on a pre-existing spectrum 
but he changes the conversation altogether. The world and these brothers, and maybe us by extension, wants to talk about striving, about achieving. But Jesus is walking to his death. So what sort of conversation is that? Instead, Jesus proposes a life that is better defined not by what we achieve, but how we serve. A life that is defined not by what we gain, but by what we give. Once the rest of the disciples figure out that what James and John are up to, they get angry. And so Jesus quickly intervenes. He huddles them up. He forces angry brother to stand shoulder to shoulder with angry brother. And he lays out his new vision. He begins by reminding them that they are not like the rest of the world. You know that among the Gentiles, he says, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants to them. You can see the disciples' heads bobbing up and down in agreement. Yep, that's how those dirty Gentiles roll. That sounds right. But it is not so among you, he quickly adds. And all of a sudden, those bobbing heads hang in a little bit of shame. Having then dismissed the world's way of going about things, he begins to paint his own picture. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. All at once, it is a race to servanthood, even being a slave. This isn't about being like a boss, that joke was meant for the three millennials here. But it's a Lonely Island song. I'll explain later. Uh, This isn't about being a boss. This is about leading from behind. Finally, Jesus explains why it has to be this way. He isn't proposing an innovative new managerial strategy meant to maximize profits while still serving the clientele well. No, he reminds us, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. All Jesus' striving, if it can even really be called that, isn't for the payoff. It's for the ransom. It is here then that our Isaiah reading begins to make sense. In it, we are told that the Messiah was healthy, but he became sick for us. That we messed up, but he took the punishment. We were the ones who strayed, but he became the sheep that was led to the slaughter. And all the while, he didn't brag, boast, or pop off at the mouth. He quietly, faithfully did what he was called to do. So should we. As we conclude our stewardship season, it is a challenging and exciting thing to consider what could happen if we approached our giving of our time, of our talents, of our treasures, of our total selves with an eye not toward reaching a goal, but serving the most. And it's not because we don't have a good goal. We, after all, are are raising a a startlingly large amount of money with this stewardship campaign. Over $200,000 meets our projected expenses. Yet I don't want you, and I don't think Jesus wants us, driven by that need to achieve, but rather by the yearning to be serving. Jesus' life has reset the game. We are no longer defined by what we strive to achieve, but rather by what we're willing to lose. And he is not an impartial judge in these matters either. No, he lost it all in order to pave the way for us to do the same. He made so many sacrifices that he became a sacrifice. And that's the reason we're gathered here today. This is why we assemble for worship. It isn't because of what he did. It's because of what he lost. If this is true, then the challenge is before us to consider how we are to embody this loss in each of our lives. 
The good news is, is that you are not like Gentiles who gain power and then lord it over others. The grace is that you have been rescued from a life of lording and being lorded over, and you've been placed on a new way. There is liberation in following the model Jesus gives us. There's liberation to looking at the talents you've been given, the wealth you've accumulated, the faith that sustains you, and asking, how can all of these things become slaves so that they might glorify God? This is a much better question, by the way, than the ones that we typically ask ourselves. How do I keep these things going? Which is a question derived out of anxiety. Or how can I get more? There's that high achieving kicking in. Or who's after what I have and what must be done to stop them? That's the paranoia of having too much. Those sorts of questions are the way of the Gentiles. These were the questions that the brothers Zebedee were asking quietly in their heart, which Jesus knew. But these are not your questions. You get to ask better ones like, what does Jesus' church need from me right now? And how have I been called to serve? In the end... Abraham Lincoln lived a rather remarkable life, and he did die, of course, a tragic death. But our hope isn't in the model of never-ending striving we witness in so many of these memes featuring his image. No, we have a new model, the one that healed us, the one that makes us holy. And if we have hope, for others in our community to be healed and be made holy, let us begin to live in a way that models this for them. The next step in doing this is found in the pledge cards I hope that you're turning in today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.